Okay, well, hello everyone. <laughs> um, it's really wonderful for us all to be here tonight in this virtual form. I'm, my name's Lettuce and I have the great, great good fortune of being Tanya Shadrick's editor. Um, and we are here tonight primarily to celebrate her memoir, The Cure for Sleep. Um, this is, I, I hope that many of you have already dipped into it, but it's a work told in the most intoxicating and dazzling prose. And it's a story that is deeply inspiring. Um, it's a story about waking up from the daily hibernation that I think might be familiar to most of us. And it's a story of changing your life from within its own confines, the confines of motherhood, marriage, small town life, family life, womanhood. Um, I don't want to say too much about it now because T Tanya can speak about it so much better than me and Will is just about to do that. Um, but just before I let her <laughs> do that, I wanted to read out a few extracts from the reviews that have already run just to give you a sense of how people are responding to this amazing text. Um, one reviewer said, this is a memoir that reads like a fable and invites us however late in life to step out of the confines we have made for ourselves every woman will see something of herself in the clinical dissection Shadrick performs on her own history and in the cultivation of the woman she strives to become. Some, another reviewer said, this brave and beautifully written book describes the painstaking, painful process of transformation, the courageous story of a woman expanding the narrow confines of her old life for a generous, expansive, compassionate future. A future is what we're all part of today, and I would urge you all to read the book. And I will put a link in the chat to some places where you can buy the book. Um, I'm, th the book itself, I know that Tanya and Catherine are going to introduce you to, but just in brief, it's a story about Ch Tanya's journey to where she is now sitting here, a public figure in front of us all. But as well as a memoirist, Tanya is also the founder of the Selkie Press. She edited Wild Women Swimming, a journal of West Country Waters long listed for the 2019 Wainwright Prize, a book she promised to make after a single meeting with its dying author, Lynn Roper. A former hospice life story scribe, Tanya embarked on her first public work after 40 with the wild patient scrolls, a mile of writing composed pen on paper beside England's oldest outdoor pool. Since then, she has been a writer in residence at many other extraordinary locations. All of Tanya's work seeks to call forth creative responses in others, a practice which I understand the Fellowship of the Royal Society of Arts 2018. And tonight, we're thrilled to have Catherine Alto here interviewing Tanya for us. Catherine is a teacher, designer, speaker, and best-selling writer focusing on the natural world through narrative nonfiction. For the past 25 years, her creative practices fuse nature and culture. She teaches the literature of nature and place, she designs gardens, she writes about the natural world, she travels widely as a keynote speaker and a narrative performer. She is the author of Writing Wild, Women, Poets, Ramblers and Mavericks who shape how, to, how we see the natural world. She's also the author of The Natural World of Winnie the Pooh, A Walk Through the Forest that Inspired the Hundred Acre Wood and Nature and Human Intervention. Um, in a second, I'm going. Catherine is going to talk to Tanya, but we would also really love to have questions from you all. Please do put your questions in the Q&A box just at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to them both. Hello, Lettuce, how are you? Oh, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that lovely introduction. And I think Tanya's there she is <laughs> and I'm already having a flush because I'm seeing names pop up on the screen and I know everybody and I've not met them all in real life yet but it's yeah so, so I'm just really grateful that you invited me to do this Catherine because I wasn't going to and I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful to everybody whose names I'm seeing pop up thank you yeah I'm, I'm also seeing names pop up people I know from Northern California <laughs> and New Hampshire and Delaware so hello everybody and I'm so glad that you're all here tonight to celebrate uh, Tanya's beautiful book The Cure for Sleep so if you have a glass of wine everybody and I know Tanya does as well so let's cheer let's give a toast to Tanya on this beautiful book. So congratulations, Tanya. We're so glad to celebrate with you. I'm gonna Thank take a little you. sip and then I'm definitely gonna put it away. Mm -hmm. 
And more importantly, this is my toast to readers uh, without which these books wouldn't exist. So I love that I can see people that I know are already reading the book. It's really special. <laughs> Yes, and I, I've had um, um so everybody just let me, let me talk about the format. So we'll we'll be together for uh, until eight o'clock uh, Greenwich Mean Time, which is about another fifty three minutes. Um, so uh, Tanya and I are going to have a nice conversation, and I'm also fielding questions. So um, I love that everyone's saying hello to each other in the chat, which is wonderful. Um, and let, tell us where you're from. Thank you, Sarah, for the, the clink of the glass there. But for questions, if you could please put those in the Q&A um, and then I'll retrieve those, um, you know, as we go along. But we're going to get started um, with some with uh, our conversation here. And Tanya, I you caught my eye a few years ago when I saw the image of you in the handkerchief kneeling at your muse or kneeling uh, as an outdoor writer writing and someone who's interested in uh, women's history and landscape and literature, all of these intersected to create a real curiosity about who is this woman um, and what is she doing? Um, I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, and then the Cure for Sleep came out. Um, and I, I read it uh, a couple of days ago, but then I, I finished it up on a train. Uh, these last few days, I've gone to and from my home in Devon to Cambridge and back. And just reading on a train um, is just the most wonderful thing. So that's how, I, how you came to my attention. And that's where I've been um, enjoying the book for the last few days. Um, it's such a, for, for people who haven't, it's just come out. So many of you have probably have dipped into it, but your story, Tanya, is this incredible, it's an incredible story of, of, of courage, uh, near death, um, reinvention, and love and patience, passion. Um, and, uh, and I found the narrative um, had so many qualities of, of memoir, which a good memoir, which is transcendence, this idea of change. Some people want to write about they're a chapter of their lives, but it needs it to intrigue the reader. There needs to be some change. It doesn't need to be a spiritual awakening. It could be. Um, and so on so many levels, the cure for sleep was satisfying for me as a woman, as a mother, um, and as someone who, who writes and studies memoir, you know? And so I'd like to just um, ask you some questions. Um, of course. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Where do we begin? Um, where, I suppose I'm curious about, I mean, you talk about Simone de Beauvoir and you talk about uh, Anis Nin and Georgia O'Keeffe. Can you tell us just initially how you used Hollywood and actors as kind of the imp uh, these uh, uh, examples for catching my eye because you were a performative artist and a writer. So I'm, could you let everyone know a little bit about your interest in, in that? And then we'll talk about the, the writing too. Of course, and, and that's a lovely first question. And, and my readings will both relate to that. There's many subjects in the book, as you know, but that's the one I've chosen actually tonight and you didn't know that. Um, so I suppose in brief, it came out of this incredible sense of pressure in my late you know in my middle age in my 40s after the near death after the very first seven years of raising babies I was making small changes but it wasn't enough I was uh, working as a hospice scribe I was trying to um, be a pioneer of motherhood I was trying to do whatever I could to make the everyday feel um, infused with meaning um, but I had to admit to myself by the time the children started school that it still wasn't enough that there was this massive ambition in me um, that had been ignited by the near-death experience, which I, I describe as, I didn't go into the light, but I glimpsed it. And I had this, and I, don't care, I don't care whether it's physics or God, I don't care. It felt real. And it was a great collective energy waiting for me to come out and play. And as a very shy person who doesn't do parties, doesn't dance, this is a challenge. This is a life, this is a fairy tale size life challenge, which is why the book's written as fable. And I had a real confrontation with myself and I thought, always wanted to be a writer, but I've been reading books voraciously all my life and it's not, it's not advanced me towards that cause, not one jot. So I'm going to need a different playbook. And so it was desperation really. 
it was a real sense of pressure and I, I just made this big leap um, where I thought well, let's let's study something else and I looked around and of course and there were great female movie stars like Hepburn and Bacall and uh, our really iconic painters like O'Keefe. You know, they look a certain way, they behave a certain way. And um, yeah, I literally created the playbook. They're, they're in notebooks under my bed. <laughs> I literally wrote out quotes from their public sayings and wrote out descriptions of what they looked like and cut out their pictures like a teenager and put them in a scrapbook. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it, it was it, it was it was such a bold thing to do for for someone who who had led such a a, a private, mm. um, invisible uh, life. You, I mean, for a long time, you you, you talk about that um, beautifully, absolutely beautifully. And the other thing, there's so many things to talk about, but um, the sweep of your life, um, you write so richly and lyrically, and it's some some parts are like chapters are like prose poems um so evocative i probably cried half a dozen times um <laughs> sorry <laughs> no please I, I want that um uh, you know just it's some of your prose is just so beautiful um but the sweep of your life and i'm not gonna i hope i don't want to give things away because a great pleasure is finding out what caused you to have this near-death experience um and I'm not giving away any plot or any arc at all, uh, but the sweep of your life, you know, from childhood to the history of women before you and how that affected you um, and uh, uh, missing a parent desperately, um, your teenage years uh, uh, and the impact of, of your mother on your life, your father on your mm -hmm. life and um, university years as well, uh, your husband, um, and the working years, how that brought you um, a sense of accomplishment and transcendence from a different way of, 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 of you know, different class in a way. And you do talk about class. Um, and then parenthood too, you know. Um, and then it gets, it, all of that is incredibly interesting. And then it becomes even more interesting when you talk about motherhood and, um, and then womanhood after, you know, the kids leave. And so this idea of, I think a lot of people with us tonight, um, you know, are, are or have experienced or will come to experience that second half in your life when your kids are away and, you know, you've been married a while perhaps. Um, and there's this desire, you know, this, I wouldn't say midlife crisis, but if this is this desire to, um, live more deeply, you know, to suck the marrow out of, uh, out of life. Um, and you're this learning to play, um, yeah. and, and, be, uh, and, and also being so embodied, you're such this embodied to go from being shy to being so and cerebral and, and living through my head. This is the thing. I lived through the works of dead and distant authors. I lived vicariously all through my entire life, actually. Um, until the near death and coming back to life yeah so it was a completely brain-led discipline-led life well I was going to ask about that I'd love I know people would mm -hmm. like to hear. so where did you where did you get this courage we all want to know where did you get this courage isn't it interesting people are saying it's a book about courage and I think it is but if it's anything it's a coward learning courage I was a deeply frightened and nervous and fear-bound person until the age of 33 my life was this very carefully um, constructed way of keeping myself safe unfortunately for me I, I found a lovely soulmate very early in life he was quite happy to join me in that endeavor so often that makes people very lonely and socially isolated but I had my lovely husband who was happy to make the sort of fairy tale cottage life with me and then I also belonged to a very structured nearby beautiful workplace so I, I found this way to live a kind of fairy tale existence going from the woodcutter's cottage to the castle which is what the university felt like for me so you know that's how 15 years of my life passed um, and if I'm being honest uh, I think if I hadn't had the near-death experience I I, well, my plan was to stay there until I retired. Now I would have been allowed to. I was good at my job and I was liked there and I loved everybody and I loved the place. And that would have been a viable people that started work there in their twenties are still there now very happily. But in a different life, that would also have been the version of a, I wasn't an unhappy person. I was very small, but I 
had a sense of meaning. It just wasn't after the near death. Like I say, it, it doesn't matter whether it's real or not. It, I, I don't care particularly about religion or, or physics or, or biology. I just know that it felt real, like some soul dreams feel real. And it haunted me, this sense that there was a way of slipping free of self. It's a, that's a phrase that repeats in the book. And I think the courage, if that's how it's read, simply came from that desperation to recover, maybe yeah, to recover something of that feeling. I couldn't bear to wait till I died to experience that again. So I was driven by desperation, maybe rather than courage. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Um, Tanya, can you can you um, would you would you um, honor us by reading, finding a passage that you'd like to read? We want to hear you um, read. There's so, uh, and at this point, I would say, you know, at the very beginning of our conversation, when you said it's about so many things, and um, and that's because I because I've left this so late, because it's probably my only book. I'll always write now and make projects, but this is probably my only. This is the only book we, I can say for certainty. I'm not going to be a career author. And my, my forbearing editor at Weidenfeld knows that. And so it was like a little way of putting myself in the lineage of the greats I can't be. Um, so it's like sons and lovers, war and peace. You know, these books about, they're grandiose in their scope, but they also are full of loving detail of ordinary people. And I thought, if this is my only book, I want to go for Whitman. I want to go for Lawrence Tolstoy, Annie Dillard. I'm going to go for it. And Annie Dillard talks about spend it all, play it all. Don't leave anything back because otherwise you open your safe and you find ashes. And of course, that's how my first life was spent. I thought I was accruing money and security. But when the near death came, you open your safe and it, none of that is what keeps you safe. In the end, it's connection and meaning. Um, so. There's many things I could read about tonight, but I've chosen kind of like a nice little pairing of pieces. And it is about this idea of size and shape and, and being seen and why we decide not to be. So as I think most people listening in tonight know, the book is organized around two kind of parts. When I'm almost, when I think I've arrived at my last minute of living, I travel back for the first half of the book to answer, to explore the question, where does it begin? Why do so many of us turn away from risk and opportunity? And in my case, I was abandoned on the far edge of a very conventional market town in the West Country with my single mother after my dad's affair. And my mother had really um, changed her status. She was a working class girl expected to work in a hardware shop and then marry, but she um, transformed her life through shorthand typing and was the first non-grammar school girl to get a job in the National Provincial Bank in our, in our small market town where she was adored and admired by every retired farmer and colonel in the area. But then of course, by the time she's my mother, all that's paradise lost and dad has left and we're living on very short rations. And so I would watch her dress for her spa shop job. So she was working in a grocery store and bringing me up on, on very small amounts of money. And so, of course, she's, she tells me everything because I'm her only, only company. The Art of Makeup. The beauty manual, which mother asked me to open each morning, was stuffed with instructions that confused further my already unstable sense of size and shape by advising that a woman could, in every instance, make more of herself through hiding, disguise, reduction. A big mouth required unobtrusive colours kept well within the natural lines and square faces could be moved towards the heart-shaped ideal by sweeping crescents of blusher. Feet were often neglected but determined grace in walking, posture and even the expression on the face so should be sanded hard with pumice stone. As with the keep slim exercises she also got from the book, rolling wildly side to side, peddling her legs at the ceiling, flinging her arms outwards to lift her bust. Mother's fierce dedication to all these rituals alarmed and delighted me in equal measure. Looking at us both, in the round mirror of her heady smelling wardrobe, I was a frog next to the quick bright bird of her, slow, dull coloured, unlovely. I felt no envy, just admiration. Oops, sorry, and my cat scratched the pages, um, so they're stuck together. Um, no envy, just admiration, believing I would never be likewise transformed. My only real unease came whenever she invited me to dress up myself. I became stiff then and indignant, like a courtier who prefers a ritual distance from their mistress. 
More content to serve, a page boy, not her daughter. I searched the carpet for lost earring bags, cleaned out her handbag, unzipped the knee-high leather boots for her to step into. What a good girl I was, to sit by her feet like this, helping her get ready for the tongues that wagged and the eyes that kept watch. This was another early and disturbing glimpse of the system we existed in. Because although it was father who had an affair and left, it was mother, the only single parent in our time and place who paid the price. Back there, back then, a good reputation was one of the few assets a working class person could accrue. Conformity was the ruling principle. And anything which made you exceptional could cause your stock to fall fast in that small farming town with its weekly cattle sale at which people were discussed and evaluated just as much as land and livestock. And so there's many stories in the first half of the book. You see me slowly through environmental, um, familial, um, class reasons. You see all the forces and they are specific to me. But the question I ask in the minute of my near dying is more general. All of us everywhere always have these forces bearing down on us from the moments of our birth. On some of us, they weigh more lightly but they're there it's just raining down on us and those are my particular forces and you see me gradually losing my will in my way so that yeah. I become that woman who at 33 is dying with a painful sense of regret but it, it's written like fable because I want it to be both very particular to my time and place like war and peace like sons and lovers but I also want people to go oh in my family in my country it was like this that's right yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, we were talking earlier about uh, the memoir uh, Becoming Myself by Irvin Yalom, who uh, is, was, um, he's still living, a, a retired psychotherapist mm -hmm. at Stanford University. And in his memoir, which I highly recommend, it's, it's very, I, I listened uh, to a, a narrated version. Um, he talks about, you know, ripples in families um, that long after, uh, people are gone, we can still feel and sense um, their presence, just like a, a, a pebble dropped in the water. And we might not be in that first ripple, but generations down. And um, so a lot of I just, uh, reading you navigate those and identify them um, uh, and riding, riding over the wave or you know, going through them and, and stopping them you know, um, was, was just uh, um, courageous, but uh, just very, very incredibly self-aware. So um, could you talk a little bit, I'm gonna take some questions in a minute, but talk a little bit about class, because we, as an American, I have a, an American accent here. We have a different, I know some people are, are, are dialing in from the US. It's a very, we have a different class system here, but mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about um, writing about class um, mm. in this book. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was one of my foundation. There's even a passage in the book where mum's telling me, my mother's telling me a story of why she turned away from opportunity in her. She'd worked really hard to open up a bigger life for herself against expectations of her, her working class parents. And then at the last minute, she turns away from it all. She doesn't marry the barrister in London who wants to marry her. It, it, and as a child, I'm going, well, how did dad come along, this garage mechanic, when you were hanging out with young conservatives? So, and, in, and then I've got this little passage where I say it would, I didn't have, a, it would be years before I had a language for class. And before I also knew what it was like to turn away from opportunities that I've worked so long to open up. So... There have been moments in my life where I've been ridiculed and shamed for my accent. Um, going away to university, the first job I had between college and university where I was first in a big uh, country club hotel working and it was like a real mixing pot of, of runaway kids like me and people that had come out of prison and also public school kids who were used to not being with their parents and they would live in this hotel. So it's this really unusual melting pot. And it was the first time I got fully ridiculed for how I looked and how I spoke. Um, and then when I first went to university, it was the first time I felt a lack of 
intellectual confidence. I, I was like a big fish in a small pond. I was actually quite arrogant. I thought I was really clever. And suddenly I lost my voice. And, I, and then when I finally spoke one day, because it was about Jude the Obscure, the tutor went, oh, you sound like a hardy girl yourself. Well, no, I mean, that would be a whole jumping point for a big conversation we'd be having in that classroom. But back then it was devastating. I almost failed my first year, um, just stopped going to classes. Um, and then when I graduated with brilliant results, I, I was offered everything I applied for. All these like gatekeepers opened their gates to me and I turned away from all of them and scurried back to my university where I now felt at home and, and burrowed into that life I described at the beginning of the book where I, I'm living like something out of a little fairy tale. Yeah. It's extraordinary. And there are some people who in this country will really be barred from opportunities because of how they sound and look and, and things. And then there are those of us like me who things are opened up to us and then we ourselves turn away. It's a really complex subject, so I could only describe my experience of it. And again, by keeping the details quite fable-like and quite spare, the, the idea is that it calls forth other people's very different but similar examples. Mm. Thank you for that. So let's take a couple of questions. Um, so Sophie Pierce has asked, hi, uh, okay. said, hi, Ta hi Tanya. Uh, that was amazing, her reading. I particularly love the passages from your childhood in the book. Was it hard to go back to that period of your life? And how did you remember such detail? That's a lovely question. I, I think I remember things in such detail because it wasn't right. Um, so the, the hot, the horror and the fear uh, wasn't fully felt by me, like, like for so many children who live in an unsafe or a confusing or unstable environment. Um, I describe how I don't cry in those years when terrible and distressing things happen, a whiteout happens. It's like a, uh, an old fashioned flashbulb goes off. So I don't feel things, but it's like I'm this kind of, um, it's like I'm a camera from very earliest childhood, I was hyper aware because I was trying to make sense of things that were not um, safe and that were not like all the other arrangements around me. And, um, and I, I still have it, it's quite unnerving for people. And it used to be quite upsetting for me because I would see people and say, oh, we met and you said, and you would, and they're like, I don't remember. And I used to think, am I so deeply unmemorable? And, and for years I felt myself to be quite shabby and invisible. Um, but it's actually because I've got this quite unnaturally developed ability to listen and remember to ev everything. If you say something to me, I will never forget it, even in casual conversation. So it's not a fake, um, it's not a faked up kind of detail in the book. Everything is there because I do remember it. So, um, you know, so the challenge was what do I select and why? And then, of course, because I remember everything, that was the art and the challenge I set myself in the book. How do you carve away or like making catamaran boat? How do you take away and take away until you have something really slight but really strong that might communicate meaning to others? Mm. That was the beauty of writing it. Yeah. Um, a couple of other questions here. Uh, Jean Wilson has asked, did you write the book? I in like the order? <laughs> did you write the book in the order? It's uh, it's uh, it's published, I think. Um, yes. Written. Did did you write the book in this in, in chronological order? I think that's I did. I did. And there were three drafts, um, eight months because I wrote it after acquisition, which is in um, nonfiction, often things are required on proposal, but this is more like a novel. So that makes it quite rare because normally even established novelists have to show they've got a whole that works. So this was a big risk for my editor. Um, she took it on a title and a few thousand, like a sample chapter. Um, so after she acquired it, then I had to figure out whether I actually could write a book. So the first draft was terrible and I've kept it as a memento, yeah, it's a, like a hair shirt showing how yes. bad it was, yeah. Um, <laughs> the second draft was just very dark and I wasn't prepared to tell things sequentially within the parts. I kept, like in each chapter, I'd start somewhere, go back. And it was because I wasn't ready to, uh, particularly the later parts of the book that some people have already got to where I have this other love and I'm, I'm, I've, it's become Don't so destructive. Much, no, but, but, um, uh, I wasn't ready to tell those things in chronological order. 
so the book was just a mess it was incomprehensible even to me and then in the third but I was still writing it kind of sequentially in the sense of going from the beginning to the end but then the third draft which I did in a month of working every single day all the hours it was like spinning straw into gold it just took a leap to the point where regardless of its critical reception and its sales it's something if that's my only book I'm proud to have written it but that magic and that Whitman running through it as a way of showing my learning without bogging the text down with too many quotations, that all came like magic in the, in the last month. Yeah, I think there's that, that, that quality. If, if, so for people um, in the, who have joined us, uh, uh, if you're a fan of Walt Whitman, and this is, I was telling uh, Tanya, uh, this is my 1912 copy of, of, of Song of Mice, uh, Leaves of Grass. Um, and it just feels like, you know, something you'd put in your pocket mm -hmm. and walk with. Um, and somebody has been walking with it. And it's, yeah. but it, this has that feeling to it, that organic. And, um, and, the, and I love the, the first, um, I think the first quote, I'm sure you know it often. Okay. Why don't you tell us the Walt Whitman quote at the what, very the, the one that's the original epigraph. Yeah. Um, I think I think I, so I probably got some uh, the female equally with the male I sing of life immense in passion pulse and power, That's right. which is the epigraph because as I said I just decided to put everything in even though most memoirs aren't done like that anymore so it's not autobiography it's organised around this theme of waking and sleeping and my whole life is not in there by any means however richly textured it appears to the reader. Um, so that's why it's a memoir, not autobiography. It doesn't account for all the dates and all the people I've met along the way. But I, it's unusual for memoir in that I wanted and my editor let me just do everything. Life, death, the art of living, class, sex, desire, art. We just put it all in the book. And, and Whitman is my model in that, in that for those who, who know it, you'll know exactly why he's, he's the person I've chosen. And if you don't know him... Um, it was so ahead of his time at the time when Emily Dickinson was hiding in her room doing her tiny, equally extraordinary, compressed, constrained, strange sounding verses. Whitman was, well, not actually wandering America, they think now he was in his mum's house a lot of the time, we think. Um, but anyway, it feels like he is authentically wandering and he worked like me with, with dying people. He, he found his way to the, the American um, Civil War hospitals. And, and he's wandering the world, celebrating everything, male desire, homosexual desire, women. Uh, it's just wonderful. Yeah, um, that is something you say, said about memoir there is interesting because it, it is really hard to get your, your first book as a memoir out there. It has to be exceptionally well-written, you know? So congratulations for that. It really is. I've heard people say it's a literary memoir and I would say, yeah, for that, they're asked, definitely, you know, um, uh, it, well, it's just beautiful. Let's take a couple more questions here. Um, let's see here. Patrick Lim has asked, um, could you speak to the paradox of change coming from deciding to stay? Um, that's, a one, that's a very um, wonderful question by someone who I believe is a lawyer in there. They're a writer and a lawyer, so that's a, a very wonderfully uh, phrased question. And that's absolutely central to the book, Patrick. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not very practiced at speaking about it in public yet. And it's too complex, I think, to be a kind of radio appearance type of book. It it's, covers too many subjects. But um, if I was asked, I would say that the book is in two halves. And in the last minute of my living, the question is, where does this begin? Where do we turn away? And then the question that arrives with the first breath of my second life is exactly that. It's if all our great stories of personal transformation, ancient, and modern, hinge on leaving, because they kind of do. Odysseus, um, even these modern books I love by women like Cheryl Strade's Wild, Eat, Pray, Love, they hinge on severance. The heroes enliven themselves by leaving, as I say in the book. And because I'd been abandoned as a child, when I came round from the near death, I did want to run away. I wanted to take money from our bank account. And I wanted, I literally didn't care if I went to rack and ruin. I just wanted to run away. And uh, I just wanted to be free. Um, but I knew what it was like to be abandoned. I knew how it had deformed my entire life, despite all my intelligence applied to, to not letting it. And so I, I decided to stay. And I also had a good husband. There are times when leaving is important. My mum should have left her second marriage. Um, 
but I couldn't justify it in the, in the life I was. So that, that was my courage, I think, the courage to stay when everything in me wanted to leave. And I describe it in the book as it becomes a lathe and chisel. And wanting to go and deciding to stay became a lathe and chisel, shaping me in strange new ways. And, and the book does have that sculptural quality. The second half of the book, it, it, I, yeah, I, I, I study artists. I, I am mentored by a sculptor who arrives in my life as if by magic, which actually I'm finding now happens to a lot of people when they do finally step out and make themselves seen. It's amazing. Well, like you've stepped forward tonight, Catherine, I wasn't going to do this. I'm, I don't ask people to show up for me at a set time. It seems discourteous. I'll arrange launches for other people, but never for myself. Um, so it's not shyness I, I will do it for anybody else but not for myself so yeah so people showed up and, and helped me along but yeah so it was um the the decision to stay is where everything interesting in my life came from because it was and I believe now that that's actually where most great creative work comes from um whether it's fated publicly or not our really our lives get interesting when we make a real accounting of our constraints financially and then we go what can I do with that and that's what the second half of the book is about uh and was it David Nash is that the sculptor yeah yeah, yeah. I, fig I figured that out to the acknowledgements uh, you don't <laughs> that's his, um I don't know how well the cameras work but that's his ash dome which I in is in the book because I'm standing inside it just before I, I, I leave the country for a while, so yeah. It's beautiful. It's really important, isn't it, to have uh, mentors in your life. And I love that idea of serendipity when you're writing uh, at the Lido and people are coming to you and talking and so intimately. And so um, and you have that as a, a hospice scribe as well mm -hmm. and such an honor that is. Um, uh, so what would you say to, because I know that there are a lot mm -hmm. of emerging writers here. Can you speak to, uh, this is a non-book related question, but a writing life question, but mm -hmm. the idea of having mentors and people in it related who have done what you've done or peripherally have, have mm -hmm. achieved something. Can you talk a little bit about mentors in your life? Absolutely. And this is the other thing that became transformative. It didn't matter how many books I read and I read many, uh, even when I was working, I was constantly in this one-sided conversation with dead and distant authors as if I could by reading them and write reading their biographies learn how to be a writer myself now it was achieving things it was tuning my ear I think I've got a really good ear and I've read so much that at some point it kind of composts down you have tools available but it was in no way advancing me as a public person or a person with a voice of my own where everything changed was when the children went to school and I decided that I would at least for one year of my life experience the writing life so I set aside all ideas of being a published writer and I thought if I if this has disturbed my peace all my life really I, I owe it to myself Natalie Goldberg lots of the great creative writing teachers write about this um Annie Lamott as well you owe it to yourself within whatever financial constraints and time constraints you have to sit yourself down with a pen and a piece of paper and, and do it because if you can't be bothered you know, say you're a carer and I, I've got people maybe listening tonight who are carers of, of children with you know, lifelong disabilities and things. So it's facile to say you can give yourself a certain amount of time or do it early in the morning. But within your life, if you can't use a minute of that to confront the pen and paper, then it's time to let that go. And that's where it got for me. It got so painful and so disturbing in my piece that I just started to sit in a cafe. I performed it. I decided I would at least look like a writer. So, you know, the Hemingway, um, uh, what's it called? Um, oh, I can't I think, A Movable Feast, that beautiful book where he describes writing in Paris. I just played at it. I played at being a writer. And of course, what happens is that people see you writing and they turn out to be writers and they respect the effort you're making. So the first person who called me a writer was the poet John Agard. He's one of the winners of the Queen's Medal for Poetry, who it turns out lives in my town. And he was the first person to ever say, hey there, writer, how's the writing coming on? And I was like, you're a writer. He's like, if you keep doing this every day, you'll be a writer too. So. Oh, what a what a wonderful act to witness just mm. you what a wonderful act to witness for everyone let's um let's end a uh, couple more questions and, and then i'd love to hear your read again hi polly atkin um polly is asking um how, uh, polly is a wonderful poet um, yes 
uh, how important do you think it was for you to be able to tell the story that you told other people um, or brought them to publication and the public? First, um, uh, thinking of Wild Woman Swimming and the impact it had on you. Um, yeah, because I first encountered Polly's work up at Kendall Mountain Festival where they invited me to bring the story of Wild Woman Swimming and then I promised in front of about 500 people that I would make a book from her diaries and then I had a year to figure out how to actually do that given I'd never worked in publishing so as I think most people listening tonight know um, and as Polly does um, I had this single meeting with a dying fellow West Country woman um, in her hospice down in Devon um, in 2016 um, and she had these amazing online diaries but she'd never edited them or polished them and that had been writing had been her dream she was incredibly talented incredibly successful but that was the one thing she'd left too late and, and she knew it and so I was not her friend I, I loved her immediately she was one of those people like a film star just charisma coming off her and she had more friends than anyone I've ever met but I had a very specific end of life role for her she had many people she was talking to but she wanted to tell me her regrets about not publishing her writing and I was the person able to hear that and not soften it and I promised I would make her book um and then I did, and I did it at a time in my life when my own life had my second life. I had no wisdom. I had a new appetite for adventure, but no wisdom in the art of living. Um, so I'd made some terrible mistakes and felt I was over really. Um, but then of course, editing Lynn's diaries became a place to hide in first. I hid in her life. And then when the book was published, it called me back to the world. There's a chapter in the book where I I'd been hiding in my car. A project came out of that as well called Birds of Fell, but I was hiding in my car on Fell Beacon in children's school hours, just crying and feeling such a shame and a failure. And, and everybody in town knew me. I'd made myself too visible in my small town. And, and then I suddenly looked at my phone and there were just messages coming in from people who'd read this, this, this was published posthumously. Lynn never got to see it published. And people just saying, can I meet you? Would you come? And some of the greatest friends of my life came from those messages that were sitting unanswered on my phone so yeah the book saved me in the short term in the sense it gave me something to pour myself into when I'd lost a sense of my own life but then it also has connected me to people all over the world but I did it for no money I didn't do it this is the thing I I didn't do it for any of the usual rewards I just did it I think there's a line in the book where I say um I just you know just to do something for its rightness you know mm -hmm. So right. it just felt it felt right to say yes and even though it was an incredibly demanding thing to do it was worth all the years I put and I, it still takes a lot of my time to get that book to the wholesalers and to places but it's worth it it's a long answer because it's a very difficult it's a very complex situation to have her like I still represent her book and will for the whole of my life uh, it's wonderful. Um, thank you. Um, and, you know, you talked about appetites. You, you mentioned appetites. And I think I'd like to ask Jenny Knight's question, and then we'll have a reading. Um, mm -hmm. Tanya, we've talked about this before, but desire is a big theme in the book, either to improve life for the self or the vixen desire you write so, mm -hmm. so powerfully about. Uh, was that scary to write about? And why is women's desire still such a big taboo? especially in midlife, and I'm going to add, especially in nature writing, like it, it, nature writing, which you're not, you're a writer of the outdoors, but I was so glad to have something like this because I find nature writing quite, in some ways, um, limiting. Uh, it can be quite, not preachy, but quite Puritan in some ways, and we're animals, you know, let's get more humor and more appetites in nature writing, but that's just me, the nature writer talking. Why don't we go back to Jenny's question? Was it scary to write about women's desire? It was scary to feel it. It was, uh, uh, you know, and actually I've already now decided I'm gonna change my reading because um, we've talked a bit about how I use the, the female artist to, to, re to, to break through into a new way of performing. So actually I'm gonna read, um, just for decency, I'll take a few lines out. Um, uh, but I will read. I will read that passage in the book where I'm. I'm sort of owning up to this desire I've got within my long marriage. Um, it was. It was scary to feel it. So what happened? Because I've been married. Um, I've been with my husband since I was 19, and we're very compatible physically as well as um, domestically. 
Um, but this was a different order of desire. Um, I was off the pill because I wanted to know when my menopause was coming for me. Um, I was off my pain medication. I'd been in pain ever since my child was born um, years ago. I was off that because it made it hard for me to wake up and I needed to use every minute of the day to do the mile of writing in public. As soon as the children were in school, I needed to be using that time outdoors. And so I'm like so fully awake, it's painful. And with all of that, I, I think maybe being on the pill for almost all my life um, and suddenly I was off it and I was flooded with really strong desire. Um, and it was painful, I would cry with it. There were days when I would cry with and no amount of marital sex. It was, it, it, it's not anything you could assuage with pornography. It was, it was untouchable levels of desire. And I realize now in the writing of the book that it was because I, what I was actually discovering was range and appetite. I was owning my ambition. It was that as much as sexual desire, it was ambition. And it was taking you know, those limits I did in the first reading where women are taught were always too much or too little. Suddenly I was claiming this public space. People were interested in what I was doing. This shy person was suddenly a performer. I, I was like an engine running too rich. I wasn't doing anything wrong. Wrong. I was doing something wonderful but in terms of my own self and how I could handle it I had no wisdom or experience for living as a public figure yet I do now um yeah so it's pain the answer is it was just it was painful in retrospect looking back and I'm really proud of myself because now I do feel quite like a little old lady um but in my mid-40s I was I, I was superb I I was quite in love with myself <laughs> I love to hear that. You're not supposed to say. That. No, no, how wonderful. I absolutely wonderful. I, I thank you for that. Did you have a reading? I will. Um, I'm sorry, it's not the one I marked. So if everybody can okay. forgive me while I just I, I scoop okay. to it, it won't it won't Let's, take very long. So when it's called, other. it's called okay. quite appropriately. It's quite a short one, but so I will I'll skip a few bits, but can I read it all? Because I think it's so key to what we're discussing tonight. It's only, only two pages. So it's called In Heat. So I think everybody's established. So I've been, it's the first year of two years in which I'm writing this mile on giant, grandiose scrolls of paper as long as the country's oldest outdoor pool. So nothing about my life is small. In Heat. Off the pill and with my wedding ring thrown away in temper, I sat sleepless in the attic. New and unhappy nighttime routine since midsummer, when I felt the season begin sliding towards the pool's September closing day. Nye and the children were in separate rooms on the floors below, but I was still crowded, caged. Like a vixen in heat, I wanted to be outside the house, skirting fields and fences, laying scent trails, lying in wait, not sitting spinster neat on a single bed hemmed in by the books of bolder women. Actually, I'm going to read it all. And he's Nin, noting in her diary that all days should be so good. The sperm of seven men by bedtime. Frida Kahlo lying laughing on the grass with a female lover. Lee Miller posing naked for the camera of Man Ray, equals in bed and art. Georgia O'Keeffe, likewise with Steiglitz. Simone de Beauvoir delighting in a first orgasm at almost 40, just as she'd been resigning herself to losing youth and beauty. And I'll skip a little bit. Now, arriving at my creative life in my mid-40s, I was newly off the pill for the same reason I knelt each day to confront yard after yard of blank paper to see what I was made of. I wanted to learn my monthly ebb and flow and use it to propel my writing in those last years before the menopause and the unchosen changes it would make to the body I'd been born to. So I could rise fast each morning for my work at the pool, I'd also stop the sleeping tablets I'd been taking since the emergency. A flood of strong hormones, nerve pain, new estrangement from nine. All these made for uneasy nights at home, but I accepted them as the price of my enlivened days. When I did reach dream, I was often now a woman turned beast, brought to all fours by an unseen force. And with my tendons straining at their new shape, I suffered being sewn into a wolf skin and driven from town. Running them for hours, leagues, chased, escaping, low to the ground and tasting the air making a repeating pattern in the soil of three paws and a single handprint, the one that writes, which I found between my legs on waking. This was about power, range and expansion of territory, energy, appetite, ambition, 
and this made me monstrous, of course. But I was a woman, not simply glad of a few school day and weekend hours in which to write politely, but one who wanted more time, more time, more. At the pool the next day, I shivered in the sun while the hand that supported my chin felt naked, its ring finger a mollusk, unshelled, white and damp and shrunken in the place where the band had always been. <laughs> So yeah, it was. I, I loved that. <laughs> Skip you know, bits, but you get you know, the girl. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> I uh, it was. It was so rich. And um, do you have any other? Um, uh, if you if if people want to read more of that, can yeah. you t make some suggestions for some titles of women owning their uh, passion and their. Um, well, um, yeah, just their agency. It's a sense of agency, isn't it? Oh, um, oh, please. Oh, what a lovely question. Okay. Um, letters, the letters of Nin and Henry Miller. Let's set aside again. Let's just give them a bit of a pass. Let's say they're not particularly, uh, they don't fit into a, a kind of neat social structure. Okay. Um, but in terms of their relation to one another, a um, man and a woman at that time, I um, mean, what was it, 1920s, 30s, their letters and they're published are, are incredible um, because they're urging each other on as artists as well as lovers. So that's what's so exciting. It is about art and sex. Um, for the same reason, O'Keefe and Steiglitz, their letters are like a great big doorstop, but they're really worth getting because, again, it's even after they're married, he continues to have affairs and she's heartbroken and goes to, to Mabel um, Dodge's um, ranch. But they continue corresponding till the end of his life. And again, it's art and life. So it's ambition and desire. It's, it's both. And um, finally, for the same reasons, although it's unfortunately one sided, um, Simone de Beauvoir's letters to Nelson Algren, the, the American writer, are, are extraordinary. I think what's it called? My wonderful, oh, wonderful Chicago man, something like that. He was absolutely outraged that she published them. He, he refused permission for his to be included, but he famously was the person who gave her her first orgasm at almost 40. And you can look it up if you don't already know it. There's this absolutely iconic photo, which partly inspired the scrolls and the way I present myself of um, Simone de Beauvoir naked apart from some white high heels in an American bathroom and she's pinning her head and somebody's taking a photo of her from the bathroom door and there's this kind of little cabinet and you see her completely naked and then you see some of her in the mirror. And the most painful part of my desire, and let's be clear, I was not in a loveless marriage, it's completely the opposite. This is what I mean. It's outside of marital desire. Nobody can really touch it. That picture could make me cry. There was mm -hmm. something about her looking at herself in a mirror. It's not narcissism. It's, it was something about, I wanted to love myself so much that I could connect with other people because I think sometimes when we don't like the way we look, when we don't like ourselves, it, it, we hide away and therefore we don't connect richly with others. I had some intuitive sense that if I could learn to love myself, the shape and age I was, that I would start to connect with other people more richly. And, and as soon as I put myself on display in public, that proved true. No one was saying you're size 16, you're old. People were going, aren't you marvelous? I'm going to tell you my life story. So it was kind of promiscuous, promiscuous meeting and merging with other people that I was after. Well, there's this, um, you, you, you write about this, uh, we get this image of this wild animal, you know, um, and this idea of um, giving your not only write you're, you're you're giving yourself time to write in those years, but you're also um, well. One one book that's been really important for me. I read it when I was about twenty, and then again when I was writing writing wild. It's a book. It's not nature writing. It's written by one of the leading um, environmental historians um, named Carolyn Merchant, and she wrote a book called The Death of Nature, and it was. Essentially, it's about how our relationship with the natural world changed when in the 15th century, when um, uh, mechanical engineering was developed and we began to control nature through uh, dams and uh, other, other, other things um, and quantifying nature too. We used to conceive of the 
natural, the cosmos is female and it all, everything changed after that. And I, I think after I read that book initially and then uh, when I was 20 and then you know, a couple of years ago, you, it, it, it fundamentally changes how you view yourself as a woman um, and as a human being. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of living outside, living without the pill, living without the pain medication, like what, who are we animalistically? Like what, who, who, mm -hmm. what are we? Not who are we, but mm -hmm what drives and hormones and, you know, and uh, women can have testosterone, women can, you know, um, mm -hmm. let's live that. Um, so I loved, I, I very much love that in your writing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let, let's, <laughs> just to interrupt slightly, because I never want the book to um, be reductive in the sense that I am so glad I live in a generation where the birth control pill is available. I'm really glad I live in a society where safe abortion, you know, all these things, like if there are fairy godmothers beyond Wolf and Whitman and the sculptor and the wild woman in my text, the ones that are not stated in the text, it's the education system in the NHS. You know, they exist outside the book, without which I wouldn't have got to university, without which I wouldn't be here to talk tonight. So there are social provisions that exist outside my book. But when I get to speak in public, I wish to bring them forward from the wings and say, I'm so glad there was the pill. But I'm really interested when I'm within a marriage where my husband was happy to do other things, as I say to the GP when they ask about things at that time. Um, I'm really happy that I was in a safe relationship where I was given that ability to explore that without the risk of being pregnant yet again, when it would be dangerous to be so. So, you know, it, this is why I couldn't have written a, a how-to guide or a more journalistic book about waking up after the near death, because I am so, I talk so often in the book about the forces that bear down on us differently, but without cease. That's a phrase at the very end of the book, differently and without cease on my mother no less than me and um you know the things that were possible for me financially and geographically and socially are not possible for some people their constraints are going to be different but I do feel able to share this story with the sense that I believe by beginning with our constraints and our provisions a realistic accounting rather than a sense of scarcity which so many of us carry that's not actually accurate or we're too fat or we're too old or we're too shy or we're too poor I, I the one thing I do feel able to urge people to do is engage in a really rigorous uh, almost clinical accounting really what's your position in life what minutes or hours do you really have how much money have you really got um and that I, I do feel quite passionate about I can hear it I can yeah. hear it um uh, Anne Ramsey, who I know, hi, Anne, mm -hmm. uh, said, <coughs> Isabella Allende delights in being a hottie. Um, yes, okay. okay. So a couple of other questions. Um, and we'll probably go over a few minutes here because we're having so much fun. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Uh, good, I'm, hi, Jenny, you're saying this is the best launch I've been to, could listen to this for hours and hours. <laughs> Well, we won't go on for hours and hours, but um, if that's, T Tanya, would you mind answering a no, few more questions? Fine. Okay, um, let's see here. There's one I think I might've missed. Louise Newman is asking, um, hi, Tanya, did you structure, uh, did you structure to your writing, your act, the actual writing? Uh, did you work every day? I'm not quite sure. Did you structure the actual writing? Maybe that's what she's asking. Mm -hmm. And did you work every day or when you felt it? Um, absolutely had to work whether I liked it or not because I, I had a book deal so it, the, the stakes were really high I, I was already paid I got my first advance like pretty much soon after the contract before I'd written anything so I was accountable to a boss which suits me that, that I probably wouldn't have written a book if I didn't have a book deal I only wrote the book because an agent dared me to do it and got me a book deal if you see what I mean um, and I'd never written a book before so I could not treat any day of that two years as, as loose time um, but of course the, the first draft of eight months was written immediately I got the book deal we had the lockdown first lockdown so I had my children at home my husband at home he'd never been at home always commuted long hours five days a week all our lives and then also as the book uh, counts at the very end my mother finally decided to leave her 
40 years. No, people know because I share extracts. And I, so basically, it was the worst possible eight months in which to attempt to do something you've never done before to contract. Um, so I couldn't work five days a week, anything like it. So the first draft took eight months working, I'd say, three days a week in around the children, homeschooling them and, and doing all the legal things for my mum. Second draft, my husband actually said, this is insane. I see how you do everything in scraps of time left over by other people and putting you on a residency in the house. And I've kept the little timetable on my desk because it's a precious little artifact for me because you see me scribbling all over it saying, I must do this chapter, I must do that. And, in, and that's how I got my second draft. And then again, he, he relieved me of all household duties for the month of the third draft where it became the thing you're reading now. So, what a wonderful, and, I, and I took time wonderful. off in between each draft uh, partly to wait for editorial feedback but also it's incredible how much better you think your work is when you first finished it uh, and then how actually bad it is once you've left it for a while so this is why people like Stephen King say you must put your books in a drawer for at least six weeks without touching them and you must give them out for feedback and this is true whether you have a so if you're a writer without a book deal I would say don't do it all on your own because you're going to work too hard this is what worries me when people say they've been working on a memoir in private for three or four years. You, if it's nonfiction, you would have been better not to do that because editors like Letters did with me. We worked on it together. Um, Amy Littrop's The Outrun was written and she was a fine journalist, but it was still completely redone once it was acquired with. The, there's a great podcast about that. So, um, so for anyone out there listening, and I know many of you, Louise included, are writing um, long projects, I would say. You need set hours, yeah, inspiration doesn't really work. But then you also need to factor in time where you set things aside and you seek somebody who can give you feedback and comfortable though that may be, and then you go again. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I tell my students uh, not to write, you know, uh, uh, you don't need, to, there's this idea that you need to write every day. If you're under a book contract, I know that I write every day and I am ruined by the time I'm done. My back hurts, I'm mm -hmm. grouchy. Um, you know, I'm just a, a, sh a husk of a person. <laughs> Mentally, I'm quite with it. But mm -hmm. It's it's you're just not a pleasant person to be around because um, you're you're warped a little bit. You're isolated because you need that isolation. Um, but um, you know, time aside, you know, I love what you said about put, uh, a time between drafts. Um, and the best, some of the best ideas can come when you when you shift it away from writing mm -hmm. and you come back to it anew. So that space, you know, that's why I run a lot. It's because I, I don't I don't want to be near my ideas for a couple of hours. And then when I come back, it's you see them anew. Yeah. You know, those those Whitman. Um, the, so these parts of Whitman that run uh, as epigraphs all through the different sections in the book. By the third draft, I knew from my really tough, you know, by third draft, all the praise drops away. And it's like, this isn't working. You write beautifully, but this isn't working as a story. And you said you wanted it to read like a novel and it doesn't. So I let myself be frightened for a whole week before I started work again. I literally walked the fear every day. I got up every day and my work was to say to myself, I am stuck. The stakes are really high and I am stuck. And I metabolized the difficult feedback. And it was clear by this point that it needed to be organized around three lives. But this felt a little graceless, a little um, instrumental. And I'd, I'd promised my editor that I felt I could write a book with some magical qualities that, quote, might pass from reader to reader across generations and classes. Um, you know, so I kind of got my book deal on that and it didn't have the magic. And then on the seventh day, I was walking across this bedroom with some laundry and I just went, oh, my God, if I put Whitman running through it, I can have different cells like the song of my cells. I contain multitudes. And I just, I know it's the always the laundry. The I laundry suddenly, has all the answers. And yes. I suddenly grabbed my much less beautiful copy of Leaves Grass. And I found that everything I needed for all my different lives was just in there, waiting Wonderful. to be gathered up. It was, that was the, most of the book was hard work. And that was the grace that came yeah. after effort. Oh, I love to hear that. I find that um, 
uh, sleep is really good. Did you organ? Did your brain organize ideas? And your for me, my critic goes away when I sleep, and I I I I'm editing and writing when I sleep, and I wake up and everything. Oh, geez, the best writing gets done in the first two hours, and then after that, you get tired and you know. Really, really quick story. Um, when I was trying to give myself permission to even write this book, um, I knew I was in trouble. And so I only time in my life I've ever done this because I'm not new agey. I decided I needed help from Ted Hughes. So I, I tried to summon the spirit of Ted Hughes and I went to sleep and I did have a dream of Ted, but he turned up with Seamus Heaney and Ted was on his way to see a woman somewhere in Ireland and he just ate all the pasty I'd made. And it's interesting that it was real traditional Devon food. It was the, the food my grandmother cooked. He ate it all and buggered off. And then Seamus sat down really politely and, and drank with his teacup properly. And he looked at me and he said, so why can't you write? And I thought, oh, well, it's because it's just my place. And he just looked at me and he dusted his crumbs off and said, I actually need to, be. he said, but what was my death of a naturalist if it wasn't me writing about my place and my people? What were sons and lovers? What's war and peace? He said, all the books you love, surely aren't they just about somebody's place and people? And he just smiled and left. And I woke up that morning and I remember thinking whether that's, I didn't care where it came from. I just remember thinking, if Seamus Heaney comes to you in a dream and tells you to write. Listen to Seamus. Listen to Seamus. And I did. <laughs> oh, I love <laughs> that. I love mystical that. mystical experience I've ever had. Seamus Heaney came to tea. <laughs> oh, listen, listen to the writers who come to you in your dreams. Um, mm -hmm. So Sophie Pierce is asking, Brilliant. If I'm allowed to ask another question, yes, you are. Has writing the book changed your perception of yourself? Um, I think this, the second line, as I call it, when I was doing the pull, that pulled out everything difficult in me. So I didn't have any um, illusions of my niceness. It's a Sylvia Plath idea of not niceness, which most women, I think, struggle with. I, um, so in some respects, I, I've had quite painful self-awareness of what I want and what I'm prepared to do. Um, since my mid 40s and I'm coming up I'm 48 now now I'm um I'm in a very calm undirected time in my life it feels wonderful to have the book reaching readers now and going beyond me actually beyond the next couple I've got a few media obligations and festivals which I enjoy but I think it's just left me it's almost a little like being posthumous everything feels quite in order all my diaries under the bed I don't really need to look at them ever again I won't burn them but I don't need to look at them um a lot of things that were difficult in my life are kind of put away now not compartmentalized exactly but I have really fully woven them into something of beauty and use and therefore I don't really know what lies ahead I think I always want to be connected to people in surprising ways but I don't have any ego involved in that I don't need to um I'm ambitious for what I might make and the people I might meet through the book um I hope it it becomes a sort of book that means you can get invited places all around the world because I've not traveled but um yeah I don't have any egotistical need to follow this up with a book or to it's a quite free time in my life actually well I it's it's this we we talked about this the other day didn't we this um idea of um when you when you become an author of you know a, a book like the a, a book a, um you you suddenly become a uh, a public person. You know that if if something happens and you pass away, you're now immortal. You know your book is always going to be there. And I often you know I I don't I I'm a writer because I'm curious about um, usually the inter intersection between people, plants, and places. That's just kind of mm -hmm. how my brain works. Um, and, but slowly through my books, you know, and, and writing for um, different magazines um, and getting emails from your agents and publicists, you know, about different things your books have done, um, you, you become a public person and there's this change uh, uh, that, that happens, which I kind of shrank away from it at first because I'm, uh, although I, I do a lot of public speaking now, I, I didn't back then. I was scared to death of a single of a single book review, but um, but I had a mentor along the way who who helped me through things and was there to talk to, um, and a, an extremely important person in my life. Uh, so I hope that this is this is this wonderful debut in a way I know you've done other things but it, this is your own and I just yeah, I just is, we should all again like it's you know 
taking a champagne bottle and, and smacking it on the edge of a ship where you're journeying you, out. Do you know, your, your, this conversation and the questions people have asked have made me realize that actually, um, I don't know if other people know this, this um, part in, in Van, is it Van Gogh or Van Gogh? I've never actually said it out loud. It's even Van worse. Gogh. I can't, well, we know. Okay, so yeah. that artist. And in his letters to his brother, Theo, there's this, I need to learn it off by heart because it, it does, it makes me cry. And he, he's, he's talking about his anguish. So he's being kicked out of teacher training. He's, he's tried to be a teacher, but he's too passionate. He's tried to be a priest and he's too passionate. He's too much for everybody. Um, and he's really suffering and, and he's got this absolutely heartrending passage, which matches my near death experience where, and I'm misquoting, but it's still beautiful. Um, it's like someone has a great fire raging in their soul and passes by a distance, see only a thin smoke at the chimney. I've got tears now because that concept that he was seized and he's written elsewhere of his love for the world, he felt a debt of love to the world and he wanted to find an earthly way in his one life of sharing that. And it goes beyond the private sexual encounter, it goes beyond worldly accolades it goes beyond all these things it is this mary oliver has it um it's this uh walt whitman was afflicted by it he wanted a relationship with a man and it was never fully reciprocated people men loved him but not in the way he wanted but more than that he was seized with an excess of love for the world compared to what he felt the people around him he was afflicted by love thoreau was the same and i belong to that tradition of kind of transcendentalists and mystics I think and and I, I what I feel is with this the work I did from the scrolls onwards and now my birds of fell project which so many people listening have contributed to it's a single little book I made of cheap materials that goes around it's coming somebody listening tonight has just posted it I think from New Zealand back here um, and it's going to keep going for a decade and people are writing essays about grief and um, hope as the things with feathers to me. So it, it's so much made out of almost nothing. I've just finally found in life this way to communicate how much I love the world and to hear other people. I must start crying. I know almost everybody on this call tonight and um, we're all finding this way to show how much we love the world. And, and that's worth, yeah, it's worth it. And so I can survive bad reviews. I don't like them when they come and somebody makes me read them, but um, it, I don't mind this about the sales figures I've been paid. I've gone beyond all that. It's like, it's all about, it genuinely is all about connection. And that's why it's worth write, writing the book because it will hopefully put me into contact with more people. You know, that's what uh, it's about. It is, it is what it's about. And, and uh, it's funny when you're, when you're writing, it feels like you're on a lighthouse on an island somewhere or, you know, mm. and away and you're writing to this, you know, this audience who, um, and, and unless uh, they write a book review, um, and I get this when I'm public speaking, I, 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 I use narrative nonfiction techniques when I'm giving talks, um, and you can feel people react to scene making and to lyrical language, and that's the only time, really, that you, you can get reactions to your writing. It can, it can feel like a murmuration of starlings, you know, this, <gasps> Or the crying, or the or the laughter, you know. Mm -hmm. and I hope I hope you have that. I hope you have. Yeah. That. Um, a couple more questions because um, people have uh, two more questions. Um, so Amy Milios has has asked, um, what is what has been or is the most challenging aspect of writing and publishing a book? Um, for me, because the reasons I do it are so I think. Quite, are quite different to most writers. Um, most writers love the writing process and the publishing and they, they like reading. I think they like meeting readers at festivals, but it, that's a, a, it's a bit that maybe diminishes and depletes them. And then they go back in and they write the next book. For me, it's all, all the opposite way around. Um, yeah, I've kind of, sorry, I've lost my thread now. What am I trying to say? Um, the question, say the question again, because I want to answer Amy carefully. It is, let me go back up to it. Um, apologies. What has been the most challenging aspect of writing and publishing a book? Oh, okay. So the most challenging aspect for me was that to write the book about connection, I had to, even if there hadn't been a pandemic, I would have had for the first time in seven years to mainly sit in a room. 
And so it was kind of this paradox in order to write a book which might extend the rich connections and conversations I've been having, particularly as as I get older, I, I don't that's a kind of unrepeatable thing. I'll always maybe read in public and do some events, but I won't ever do these big performance pieces again. I'm just too old and my health's too poor. Um, so paradoxically, I had to fully take myself away into a room and that was the hardest thing. I came to enjoy it. I came to love the deep craft of, of working on my own at something, like making a Japanese sword or something, but that was the hardest thing. I missed people. Mm, it is really, it can be really isolating. Mm. <laughs> and your position too, uh, I, as we understand from your writing, uh, was, was hard on your health too, um, yeah. the, the kneeling. So another yeah. question is, has the writing of the book um, changed your perception of yourself? That's from Sophie Pierce. Um, yeah, I think, I think I've answered that in the sense that, that. Yeah, sorry yeah, I, that. I, sorry. I, yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, I looked at that, I thought I asked no. that. Um, okay, Ruth uh, Rosengarten has asked, uh, I'm intrigued, I'm so intrigued about how your loved ones, your children, but also especially your husband deal and how you deal with bringing so much of your private life into the public space. Um, well, of course, it feels like an incredibly intimate book, but if you actually dissect the book when you've read it, you only see my children at the point where they are born and soon after. Um, and then you only see each of them very, very briefly after that. My daughter has a very short chapter, which after I'd written it, I, I called her in and I said, before I even tell dad, I want to read this to you and your brother together because he appears in it as a small, but you're critical to this part. But if this isn't okay for you, you're not named, of course, or described physically. But if this is not okay for you, then it's not going in the book. And she started crying and she threw her arms around me and said, mom, that is me. You see who I really am. And my is son the said, the, I'm um, sorry, the one called, no, the one called Wingbrush's Cheek, which is written in third person. And it's because I wanted to give her and I equality in the scene. You're walking along, it, walking, walking together. the chalk path. And it's yeah, after my, my, my heart break and, and, and all of that, you know, this love has left my life. You know, this person I would have wanted in my life forever is gone. And, and she names that situation with an act of such grace. And even though she was only, only young at the time. And um, I wanted it to feel almost like, because there, there are, objects that repeat through the book like the willow pattern plate of my childhood I invoke it several times and I wanted that chapter it's not called that but I wanted it to feel like a, a Japanese plate like a precious object honoring that little moment in our lives but you don't hear a lot of the ups and downs of my mothering it's everything's taken to essentials and the same with my marriage so in a bizarre way it feels like a very intimate book but it actually doesn't I mean you don't hear my in-laws mentioned at all and they're obviously in my life I've, I've had another family in my life for talks there's a lot my husband, you know, it's like I've, I've chosen a pseudonym for my husband. My children aren't named at all, not even in the acknowledgements. I don't post about them online. And I think it's that kind of measure in my day to day life made it possible to write quite intimately. But again, it's all about selection of detail. And that's what makes it art, not confession. That's right. And, and when writing a memoir, it's different than an autobiography, as you pointed out earlier. A memoir is just a little slice of, of something. Um, and just because it happened doesn't mean it needs to be included in the memoir because you need that. You know, there's so many parts of the craft to writing, aren't there? You know, that you just because it happened doesn't mean it's going to make a good story. And that's for sure. Really and, and there are people who've done me great harm in my life who are tangentially in the book um but unless and this is my own personal ethics that I applied to the project I do believe there are people in our society who deserve our shame and they deserve exposure and they deserve naming and I think these are people that hold political power or their parents abusing children or um their politicians local or national these or corporations, these people deserve our anger and they deserve shaming and they deserve to account for all of their private actions if those private actions compromise their ability to do a public role. I'm, even though I'm a public person as a writer, I'm essentially still a private individual. I hold no institutional power over everybody. So I do not have to account for everything that happened with my other love. I do not have to go into the details of my relationship with my in-laws who are not in the book. And so well, anyone that's in the book, I have tried to show understanding for them, even the people who haven't given me what I wanted, because, again, these forces bear down on all of us. My father was a wonderful father to someone else. 
he just was not available to me. And that's because he'd been bereaved of his father the year before I was born and his mother had never loved him. His brother got brothers. the farm, he got nothing. And so the book had to achieve these moments of grace. In my private life, I can be quite angry and judgmental, but if it's going to be art, oh, there has to be a point, I believe, where, where people need to be named and shamed. You have to show grace and understanding and also restraint. Absolutely. Where could I, how could I show the impact of people's lives on me without shaming them with gratuitous detail? And that was a big part of the writing of the book, taking things out. Taking things out. And I teach uh, my students, um, I have everyone read an essay by John McPhee that he wrote in the New Yorker about omission. omission. Mm. And that is, we don't, are you familiar with that essay? I haven't read it, but I will find it. Yeah, sounds I'll like speaking my language. Yeah, and it's this idea of we don't. Uh, the, there's a relationship between yourself and the reader um, that a lot of emerging writers don't yet understand. And there's this sometimes overwriting, overwriting that happens. You want every detail listed. You want, um, um, uh, and what? But you need to understand that the writer brings their own background, their own experiences to this text that you've created. And that sometimes it's best to just to give a watercolor impression mm -hmm. of a person, some light details and let us fill things in. You know, Do you know the greatest, the greatest, and I'm mindful of people's time, but the, the greatest compliment I'm receiving already on the book, because quite a lot of people have read it already, it was released a bit early, is people are beginning to talk, and this includes people who know me in my, my town life, my friends that I see, because I can consider everybody on here tonight, my, as Adam Nicholson calls it, our Twitter friends, and they're, it's genuine friendships to me, everybody listening tonight pretty much I know, and they're my friends, um, but I mean my friends in town, and they start talking about themselves when they say they've read the book and then they stop and they go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking about myself, I'm talking about my mum or my auntie or my gran, and I'm like, and I haven't said anything good about your writing. And I'm like, that's what I was trying to do. It's like, I wanted my stories to call forth your own memories. I wanted to give you access to the things you have minimized or compartmentalized. I don't want to disturb people's peace of mind. I just wanted it to be, I say at the end, but I want to be a quiet invitation. I don't want to change people's lives. They're not a prophet. I, I find that dis discourteous. I believe in courtship. I believe in stepping forward into an open space with my own values laid out. And then if people want to engage with me, they can. And that's what the book is meant to be. It's meant to be a quiet invitation. Oh, that's so beautifully put, graciously put. Okay, um, we're not going to go much longer, but I see most people are hanging on, which is lovely. A uh, queen of the human condition, Jenny writes. Um, Wonderful. So uh, Sheila de Corsi is saying, Tanya, you have given opportunities to so many people to tell their stories. Thank you. Have you ideas for how you might continue this or any other such projects coming up? And that's been, thank you. And Sheila is one of the, the many wonderful contributors to another of my communal projects because everything I do has to have a communal aspect. So the challenge with the book, being in a room, was how can I maintain that Side of myself which is so foundational so I, I said to my publisher this is tricky because I've always done everything myself but you are going to need to let me share free extracts all year before publication because that's the only way I feel I can um, be congruent with the person I say I am I don't want the act of making this book to make me a fake um, and so I've been sharing extracts all year and deliberately and there's been by the book links in in most of them but then in the last one I deliberately didn't put it in because it's not it was never about a mailing list of people to buy my book it's so easy to buy a book if you want a book the idea was this would be a community of people who would be responding. It wasn't even about getting beta feedback. It was nothing that instrumental. It was like, I'm gonna give this away because I can't give the book away. I'm contracted. It wouldn't exist without a publisher paying me, but I can give these extracts away and I can invite people in a safe space to tell me stories on each of those monthly themes. And, and so many of the people on the call tonight are people that have, some of them are more writers already. Other people have been published on, on the book's website for the first time. So there's this story archive called Stories From and Beyond the Book. 
and it's become a community just like my birds of fell project and just like the pell's pool and the wild swimming project so everything i do however public or obscure has got to have a communal call and for um i think uh, david abraham's the, the the writer on the natural world calls it call and response wonderful and so yeah. i think sheila it will be I'm hoping a publisher would give me some kind of role, a bit like Paul Auster did with True Tales of American Life, which is a book I love, which he did on national NPR radio, where he asked people to tell him short true tales. And then it went into book. I think I'd like to become sort of bizarre little dusty national treasure where I'm given permission to collect other people's stories and curate them. That would be my dream job, actually. So, a dusty um, national treasure. I would just like to be a proper little old lady, you know, like I this smart and you almost look like a toddler you've got your chopped off hair my granny Shadrick looked like that she was old uh, and young at the same time I'd like to be an old young woman who I just get to curate people's stories that feels like a nice note for everybody because it is I, I don't want to sound like a beauty queen it's not that it, it, I get so much from from contact with other people this is this is the point I, I no longer have a narrow purely personal life so everybody tonight is just a demonstration of why I should have written the book Oh, thank you for that. Um, Patrick has put the um, uh, link. Patrick, Patrick, could you put that link to the omission essay, which is which is correct? Uh, could you put that in the um, in the chat? So, um, or if people want to look at it in the questions, that's fine. Um, one last question, and we'll we'll end at half past um, the hour. Um, thank you all. Um, one more question was, oh, anonymous attendee says, <laughs> do you, <laughs> hello anonymous, uh, do you think you will spend time in the future mentoring or helping others to write? Your passion for writing is infectious. Well, I already do. So most, of, uh, I think a lot of the people on the call tonight are people. So um, after the second draft, I put a call out that something unpleasant happened online around nature writing and privilege. And a lot of people were frightened off of even trying. It didn't matter. I'd been personally attacked. That was shocking, but I got over it within a few days. But what really upset me were um, the really fine men who'd been attacked who, who, because they have big followings, didn't feel able to say anything, kind of gentlemanly cold, but worse with the many people contacting me saying, if that had happened to me, the, the shaming you've got for your one Twitter poem, I'd never write, I'm already scared to send things away. And so I did an open call and it was pretty tiring, but I, I did an hour, really an hour and a half every day for 14 days straight with pretty much anyone who was first. And I do that whenever I have free time, I, I do an open free call. I will do paid mentoring in future. I mean, people that have worked with you, Catherine, I mean, they get so much from it. And, and I'm kind of in awe of what you offer people. Um, I just wasn't free in these seasons to do that. But um, until I can do proper paid mentoring, I'm going to try and give small amounts. So I like a seed fund. It's kind of like, I think people can go, to, to achieve the book projects that people do and the published work they do, they need your kind of support. And I couldn't do that for free and I wouldn't. It was it's a professional service. But in the meantime, I just plan to give away as many single hours to people. I'm not promising anything more than I will listen to you fully for an hour in confidence. And, and I, I believe people can go quite a long way on that in terms of getting started. So that's it's something that, I always do. It's that belief. People need um, to get over the castle wall and they just need yeah. someone to put a ladder out don't they so at the um, moment I do that but long term another thing I would love to be doing is working with people like you and James Rebanks and, and the art and people I think I'll need another book for that but you know I think this book will probably open up those kind of roles to me because I would like to earn I you know I need to earn money I've, I've, I've made some really major financial decisions to live this strange life um, it's a good job I worked and went nowhere and spent nothing in my 20s that's a, that's a but you know I need to have a job from my fifth you know from 50 onwards I need to be earning as much as possible and I would love to combine it with teaching people writing it's wonderful it. <laughs> um so let's see here um uh, would you like to end so we're gonna uh, we're gonna end now um and Tanya I uh, thank you all for your lovely supportive comments I see them all um, everyone is just really, really, um, thank you for helping Tanya enter this, this, this wonderful new phase. And by the way, you know, there was, uh, from, from, for, you know, the afterlife of a book can go on for quite a while. I mean, so. I was, you know, um, so, you know, just be, be prepared for the next six months, you know, at least, um, well, I hope it goes on longer than that. Like I say, this might be my only book. So I hope it's a kind of book that will just, I just want people to invite, I want it to be my spiritual checkbook. People kind of know what my values are. So they might risk me coming as a stranger to their town hall or their book group and 
uh, that's the big risk. So I hope I hope that I hope it will get me invited places for a long time. Oh, I'm sure it will. What I'm, I'm sorry, I meant to say, like there gets to be a buzz for a while, but then it, it, yeah. then it, then it settles and you become like stuff's hard. Yeah. yeah. Do you would you like to um, leave us with a couple more of your words? It's an exquisite moment when a writer uh, reads reads her work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm th thank you for asking. Let me um, find something really quickly. Okay. If people and I appreciate people might need to to hang off and that won't hurt my that won't hurt my feelings at all. Um, sorry, that one's something I've just read online. So let me find something else. Hmm. Sorry, hold on. Right here we go. How to live. How to die. How to reach back with understanding, even as we are going beyond the ones we love. What I wanted to learn fast in what I believed was my last minute of living in that moment before I was laid awake on the operating table. These are the questions I will pursue now to my end of days. What started with an emergency having become my passion and my purpose. In my first life, I placed my faith in rigid routines, believing I could put to sleep my wilder desires. In my second, I went without rest, searching always for ways to escape myself from the pain of living, to slip my skin and merge forever with something beyond me. I tried mothering, unpaid acts of service, immersion in cold water, the making of art, and then lastly, disastrously, I hoped to get lost in love. And I don't know why, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> because at the very end of the book, that's the beginning of what I call the third age. And so you see me going, hmm, first two lives, not quite there yet. And then I have to go again right at the end of the book. So, and for the people that haven't got there yet, that feels like a nice kind of, we're supposed to have mystery in a book. I explicitly reject that um, about the third way. I say there will be no more suspense and melodrama, but for the 